So my name is Barbara Irvin, and I started in the nursing program on the SOU, uh, SOC campus uh, back in about August of 1971, when the associate degree program was just about two years old. And Betty Haugen had started that, had come down from the operating room at uh, OHSU in Portland, and, um, and she started that associate degree program which was um, amazing in itself in lots of ways. And uh, when I applied and came to work, I was taking the place of someone who uh, was a specialist in the mental health area. And our, the program, the curriculum as it was, had been adopted was uh, called for integrated program and so everybody had to be sort of a jack-of-all-trades so I ended up taking that person's position I had been at Rogue Valley Hospital before that and um, so we were using a, a pretty innovative curriculum that had been adopted by various schools across the country and one of the questions that Betty Haugen, who was chair of the department, uh, asked me and asked all the other faculty that she hired any time on the years after that, if they would stick, the person, if I would, uh, starting with myself, um, would adhere to this curriculum because one of the issues that people have, uh, or faculty have, is if somebody comes and is hired and doesn't follow the, the curriculum because they've got other ideas and they just sort of weave their way and their ideas into the thing. It makes it really difficult for everybody. And so um, that was something that was really important to Betty and, um, and became really important to the rest of us who were, uh, got really involved in it. And that, that program was very creative in that the authors of that curriculum uh, wanted students to have experiences of um, sort of playing at things so that they could learn some stuff without all the stress and anxiety that nursing students tend to have. So there were lots of little things like having little small doll beds and things that, to try to um, uh, practice things on in a sort of a miniature scale. Uh, that is something that moved over the many years till the more recent uh, past, where uh, where there are things where the students act out things on um, according to scripts in nursing labs now, and the things are videoed and things are prescribed so that students get more experience in lab setting and about making them as real as possible. So the beginning of that, as I see it, was way back then in the 70s, um, perhaps for the authors of the curriculum starting in the and they were in Florida, um, that they started that in the late 60s then, I would say. So back in those days, when I was hired, I became one of six nursing faculty that we had here, and our offices were actually in rooms in a cottage up behind the science building where, the, where a parking lot exists now. And um, we had a little cottage there, and um, we had two faculty in, you know, like, like in a bedroom situation. We had two that were in the living room, and then uh, I shared with another faculty on what was like a, a sleeping porch or um, a sun porch type thing. But uh, anyway, so we all had, we had two in an office, and, and it was just such an interesting thing. We had our faculty meetings in the kitchen, and Betty Haugen, our chair's office, was down in the science building. And we taught our, our nursing labs 
in what is now one of the uh, anatomy physiology labs. In fact, it was before we started with nursing and there were a lot of bargaining that had to go on over a number of years where there was competition between science and nursing for space and for dollars, um, where it was like really important for the nursing students to have science courses, just like they also needed psychology courses and, and English and speech and sociology, you know, and anthropology. You know, there were various courses from all the other departments because nursing was a, always a conglomerate of all these many science, you know, things, sciences and this, uh, the arts. And so there's often we talk about the art and science of nursing uh, and both are really, really important. So um, anyway, one of the things that, that stayed with the nursing faculty, probably even till now, but although I have not been active in the more recent you know, past, um, but as long as I was there, way up until 2007, um, we had many interactions that went on in the kitchen of building, even up in Central Hall, because when, when we moved from the cottage, that got to, moved to another place, so that the parking lot could be built, <laughs> and, uh, we moved to um, Central Hall. And over the years, we were on the first floor of Central Hall, and then this, well, not the, in the basement, except, well, actually, we did have a couple people in, in the basement uh, in an office, but, uh, we were on what I guess would have been the ground, f the f I call it first floor and second floor. So we shared on the second floor, when we were up on the second floor, we uh, crossed the hall from math and down the hall from English. And so, uh, so we formed really great relationships with people in these other departments. And, and many of us, or several of us, I should say, at any given time, we're very active in um, anything from the building committee on campus with everybody else, um, uh, or, or the, um, the faculty senate, and different things. So we were really a part of, of the main liberal arts college campus, and many of the student, the parents of students who sent their, their sons and daughters to uh, our program here were very, they liked the idea that we were on a liberal arts campus um, and, and that there was such a close relationship with faculty in all the departments. It wasn't just in nursing. Um, so that was a real strength of our department. And then the associate degree students you know, didn't, needed to be in clinical a lot. So one of the things that we had to compete for space in the community, both in jo Jackson County and Josephine County, were with Rogue Community College for uh, units for pediatric experiences and obstetric and maternal, I mean, and medical and surgical nursing things, and, and times out in the community and clinics and so forth. So that was always something, and we always worked these things out, but um, that did take uh, you know, effort sometimes. And fortunately, there weren't anything that wasn't, was too hard to work out. You know, we, we could always manage to do that. So there were a lot of these facilities that were shared and we would have certain days. One of the solutions was to have certain days of the week that we would have students in clinical and like Rogue Community could have uh, those floors at the hospital on different days than we were and stuff. So all that impacted how we implemented a curriculum. Um, so one of the other things in the early days was um, looking for mental health facilities for the students. Um, in the early days, we had a pediatric unit on the second floor at Rogue Valley Hospital where the mental health unit the behavioral health unit, as they called it, eventually got built. And um, so pediatrics went to a wing uh, outside, you know, the, projected out from the hospital into that circular uh, wing that they still have now at Rug Valley. And there were some pediatric uh, places, 
uh, experience with uh, opportunities for our experiences with uh, babies and um, and children um, at uh, Grants Pass also, um, and so and then we used uh, clinics. So we did a lot of things that would have students in places where. Uh, things were less acute than in the hospital, and so they would have a chance to interact with families more and things. Along the way, we ended up feeling a great need to help nurses who were prepared at either at the diploma, in a diploma school, or at the associate degree level to get their baccalaureate so that there would be more uh, nurses in the community available uh, for leadership and management um, uh, experiences and, and positions in the hospitals and then in the clinics. And uh, also for, there had to be a way for them to do that. So we put, we developed then a two, what we called a two plus two program. So we had ended up developing a baccalaureate program that probably started in the mid 70s, maybe in 1975 or so. Uh, roughly, <clears throat> the uh, back, that program allowed nurses to come in and uh, get a, a, a pretty good amount of credit for what they had already done which was a change because people were kind of stuck and in the schools and the co at the collegiate level or university levels, um, it was really hard to get any transferable credit. And nurses had lots of years of experience sometimes, but there was no way for them to progress without starting all over again. And that's expensive and time consuming and people had families and, so having this develop a program where you could come in as an RN, be given quite a bit of credit for what you already knew, and then to have pro coursework that was really focused on leadership and management and community health and, um, and, and some educational opportunities. So because nurses were teaching, for example, myself, when I started out teaching in 1971, I only had a baccalaureate degree. I had a teaching credential from California, but I didn't have a, or like a certificate type of thing. But I didn't have a, a master's degree, and it, and it really wasn't required except in certain positions. And in the universities it became much more uh, in demand, but even here over the years it became necessary for accreditation purposes to be able to teach with have, have your faculty prepared at the master's level. So then many schools um, d would have the faculty who were prepared only at the baccalaureate level, they would be teaching in the clinical areas and those that taught in the classroom then or were trying to do research would have to be prepared at the master's level. So there was always this staggered of um, figuring out what what nurses needed to learn and what was going to take, what kind of preparation was best, both for them to work in a future setting, but also to be able to teach the students who were going to be graduating and working in, you know, down the road in 5, 10, 15 years. So uh, it's sort of the same issues uh, people in the faculty in other disciplines have, is how to prepare the students to um, be good citizens in the world and, and be able to earn money and, and so forth. But in a, a rapidly changing field with, with technolo the technology changing very rapidly and the science behind things, um, right or wrong, as discoveries sometimes turn out to be disproved and, you know, the, and, and science changes, but um, those um, became it really was necessary for nurses to really not only keep up with their field but identify what the field was and because nurses the nursing discipline or profession um, draws from so many different disciplines so in order to develop a doctoral program for nurses for example for faculty to go to or researchers to go, 
we had to figure out and identify this. I say we, this is nationwide, it's global, but it's particularly nationwide in this, you know, for us in this country, had to identify, okay, what content from anthro or sociology or English or biology and how necessary is chemistry and, you know, many of us, because we all had chemistry, we just thought, it's, that's absolutely, we've got to have chemistry in order to understand the pharmaceutical effects of medications and things like that. Uh, but at some point, we developed a consortium, and when we, so that they would have more students prepared at the associate degree level who could then get their um, upper two program, the upper two years, um, all over the state. They didn't, couldn't just li be limited to coming here or to Klamath Falls or Eastern Oregon. That there were a lot of places where they were, uh, they were able to get the first two years, they should be able to get the second two years. So it was always a matter of a kind of, um, then determine what was necessary. So if one of the associate degree campuses did not teach chemistry, I mean, it like, you know, I could pick anyone and I don't want to really do that by name, but it's just if one of the other schools, the community colleges, you know, if they didn't uh, have uh, a chemistry offered on their campus, then we couldn't require it as part of the consortium. So um, we had to give up things. So we used to talk, and faculty used to talk about the sacred cows of curriculum, and chemistry had been one of them, and we had to give it up at some point. Um, but we finally did come up. People work really long and hard across the curriculum, and some people from our campus uh, in particular did that. I really worked, make it work, and it did work. And so for a lot of years, we were doing that. Our campus, meanwhile, was told we had to drop the associate degree program and leave it for the associate degree programs who, for the community colleges to do that level and that we would focus only on baccalaureate. So these mandates come from uh, higher uh, authorities um, that are for decisions that are made on, on a higher level in Oregon. Uh, so sometimes political um, things get in the way. You know, how much is uh, cost effective to do this versus that, you know. So um, as is, um, Oh, before I go on to the next little piece, I wanted to say, so that that worked in in, a, in the pro, it worked, uh, but while we still had the two plus two program, we had an extended campus program that was developed, uh, so that our we had quite a few faculty who would travel then to um, Qua Community College in Roseburg, or up to the Dalles. Um, to Redmond, to various places, over to Coos Bay, uh, delivering classes. Uh, and then we finally set up uh, some structure with um, where there was a, uh, an administrative assistant in Roseburg and one in, um, and in Coos Bay and associated with those community colleges there. And then our faculty would go and we would, and the, we would teach classes in maybe in the evening. And then the students didn't have to come to, to, to our campus, except maybe once or twice, you know, here or there, they'd come for certain things. But um, basically, they could get everything they needed on their campus, either by us taking it to them or um, them getting it on their own. So the students started getting, being able to do research projects and to teach, but what was so wonderful is because of the independence of those students who had already, you know, they were already independent nurses, uh, or I should say, they had, you know, they were earning money as registered nurses um, and working in really good positions. And so by having this set up, similar to how um, many disciplines will offer uh, courses for people uh, on, on extended weekends. And we did some of that where students would come and take uh, uh, 
an immersion for a weekend, you know, or several weekends during a term to get a, a course that needed to be taught from here, uh, only because the faculty couldn't travel or something. And then we moved into distance education, where things were televised, and then we could, they could just sit in class on their own campus and uh, take a course, and it could be delivered from Portland or from here or anywhere. So back around 1991, um, 92, there was a lot of upheaval where um, things look, looked like they were going to assign the School of Nursing or the Department of Nursing here to be merged with OHSU in Portland. And in about 1990, 1993, that I think is the year that actually happened. And so that um, the use of the television uh, or the distance for distance education became imperative at that point. And uh, when I learned a master's degree from OHSU School of Nursing, I had to commute. And that was like 77, 78, and um, I think I finally finished that master's in about 82. Um, but I had to do the commuting, where by, by the time we got distance education going and the cameras and everything, it would miss, made it so much easier that we could, we could enroll a whole class of um, masters students working on their masters and stuff, which was actually a huge uh, step forward in helping our community to have nurse practitioners. And then, I mean, that was wonderful. And then that, on down the road, became, that was the forerunner for the doctoral program that became uh, possible for students to be able to get some classes down here um, and participate with a cadre in Portland at the same time. Um, so um, over the years, and while I was still in nursing here, uh, in one way or the other, at the baccalaureate level, then the people were working, I mean, community, local community people here could go ahead, sometimes including our faculty, could take uh, courses in the doctoral program. So we made, a, a, that was a lot just um, in 30 years, you know, 20, 30 years. It was just, it was quite, quite amazing. Ex resources, though, I mean, you know, the money for all these things, it's always hard to come by. And, and so over the, those many years, the, getting really good working relationships with the community agencies, the hospitals, the foundations, um, just uh, local groups of interest that we wanted to support, um, we wanted nurses in the community that were prepared at higher levels, wanted well-prepared faculty in the state of Oregon. You know, um, There were a lot of contributions made that helped so that we could, they would um, make facilities available to it for our students to practice and do things that I mean, sometimes it like was over above and beyond sometimes to make these things happen. And certainly that was true in the outlying communities like in Coos Bay and, and Roseburg and, and other areas, Klamath Falls. And we, we had really good relationships usually with the faculty with Klamath Falls, OIT. And they would come over here. They also were part of the um, OH, belonging to OHSU. And so uh, it, was, it was quite a, a wonderful time for developing leadership and, um, and, and great relationships among, between faculty and leaders, uh, nurse managers at these hospitals and uh, the health department and so forth. When wonderful to see like one of our, one of my first students, in fact, there were several of them from that, uh, you know, they kind of stuck together through thick and thin. And the earlier, you know how it's wonderful to have students buddy up together and, and they really help support each other through a program. And, and one of ours, um, Gwen Bowman, became uh, the director of the nurse of nursing over at the health department in Grants Pass. 
um, and to see these students from beginning all the way through, you know, to where we're, they're providing clinical experiences for our students. It's, um, it's pretty amazing and very rewarding, you know. And even now in this community, there are many, many, many nurses who started here in one or maybe both of the um, more basic programs and continued on. Um, so when we became part of OHSU, there was a lot of resistance to that here because the nurses uh, and faculty, I mean, we were all very, very partial to having uh, our own, S uh, you know, what well, was SOC and then it be, you know, became SOSC and then it was SOU. We always were proud of it. And glad that we had, uh, right here on our own campus, we had our nursing program. Uh, and at some point, the resources just became really so tight. It's not much different nowadays. Sometimes the departments have to be reorganized and uh, the budget's always, you know, there's always the crunch time and are faculty gonna be able to stay or do faculty have to leave? Um, because we can't afford that and so forth and so on. So we went through many of those times and there were it was more than once that I remember Betty Haugen getting a, a note sent to her in the, at perhaps one o'clock in the afternoon or something to show up at three o'clock for a faculty senate meeting to, to explain why we should keep nursing on this campus because the chemistry and biology and these other departments needed the money. And, um, and yet they needed our students to, f you know, we fed them students <laughs> um, and they prepared our students. I mean, it was a great <clears throat> exchange. <clears throat> Excuse me. But, um, it, but when money's tight, there's a lot of balls in the air, you know. It's like, okay, how's this gonna end, play out? So eventually, uh, we did end up going with, um, uh, becoming part of OHSU. And while there was resistance and there was some resentment, there was also um, some prestige that came with that for the students and more opportunity, more money. Um, available, which uh, because of that we were able to develop uh, research projects more because we had the facilities f and the support on, from on the Portland campus. People could write for grants and and fund um, the video projects that started. The, you know, we started with the um, for the nursing labs and so forth. So that students could go to clinical much better prepared. Um, and as the hospital environments became more and more acute, it became more and more necessary that students um, be more competent as well as have a more confidence you know, when they were there so that they weren't shaking <laughs> and, and appearing so nervous to a patient who is being asked if they would be all right, they would accept a student for the day. You know? and so there's, um, it's just pretty amazing. We have a lot of people to thank for having been patients, but on the other hand, most of them are really happy to have nursing students <laughs> because they got a little more attention that way. And I mean, I can't say that was 100% that way, but you know, it was a good program and it's, it's still a good program and, and that's pretty awesome. Well, we used to have a huge waiting list. I mean, like 300 maybe. And there was always that thing about, we used to have interviews and then it was like, there were all these things that would come out from things like affirmative action that you couldn't ask this and you couldn't ask that. And pretty soon we did away with those interviews. And at some other point we had them back for a while. And so there's always that issue about fair admittance and that sort of thing. But we would take um, I'm trying to think, we had 24 maybe at a time. Sometimes, uh, a class, as as facilities would change. Sometimes we could take more, um, sometimes less. But we tr um, we tried to. See, it used to be when we could, could take 36, say, because we could have 12 in a group and we could have three groups. 
but that, that was hard to manage 12 students in the group as clinical facilities at the, and the patients in them became more acute. Uh, it was harder to do the, uh, the kind of supervision that nursing students needed to be safe and um, to be safe for the patients and for the patients to feel like they were getting good care, you know. And the nurses that we would pair, put them together with did not feel like they don't have time. They don't have time for the students because things were so busy. So we would get down to about eight students then in a clinical area. That became much more doable, uh, more realistic, and they were getting more preparation in the labs. We, there's always been things in the beginning when we always had a nursing skills or fundamentals labs way back when I was a student in the dark ages. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but it became that students had to learn how to think on their feet and move faster and make decisions in a setting like this uh, and not wait till we get into the clinical area to have them realize, oh, they couldn't function in that kind of environment. They really wanted to be in a calmer setting and things like that, which is how you sort out what area you might go into later. So we uh, started out with all females and all female faculty. Uh, one of our, we did have a, uh, our token male student, Rick Daniels, who was um, recruited out of Central Oregon. Um, he was an OHSU graduate um, initially. Uh, he had, and he had some background in the military. Uh, so he's a great teacher, the students loved him. We did have more, um, we did have more male faculty, I mean male students over time. Um, it wasn't always a really good match. Some, are, one of the students I remember, male students, way back in the early 70s, actually wanted to be an, uh, an anesthesiologist, but he came in through nursing. And uh, so he wasn't really <coughs> wanting to be a bedside nurse. And of course then I should interject here, nurses went nursing itself went through a big change. So in the public perception, was finally able to catch up with that, I think. But um, as it did, more people were willing to accept a male student. Um, we were always careful to be sure that a patient was willing and that during, if a, during at any time, a patient, uh, a female patient, did not want a male student, you know, we accepted that. Uh, or if they were, did have a male student uh, for a given period of time, certainly during anything that was more, um, required more privacy, um, we would have a female student, you know, cover for that or uh, have the, the, the nurse that was assigned that patient. Uh, I think some people, it's like when I was in, working in the South and initially when I was in school, we had people come in who didn't want a black, uh, black nurse. You know, they, um, oh no. They, they, uh, I mean, I, I really, we had to uh, tell the patients who would have to leave. I mean, we had black nurses in that hospital, you know. Um, and um, so that's the, like in the, now, some of our best nurses, really, in, in the environments of, uh, like emergency room, and so a lot of them are male nurses. Um, but a lot of times it's a personality that is going along. So it's not always a good match and, uh, with a patient and a student. Some students came in from forestry, from the mills or other places where they, and they were able to adjust and do fine, but, but and largely that really didn't always work that well because of that what they came into nursing because they knew they could get a job and they get done. And, and then no fault, I mean, no blame, it's just, and the, the lim lumber industry here was changing. There's a, so, you know, everything affects everything else. So, um, but definitely some resistance um, about having a male student. Some people had ideas um, about gender orientation and so forth that, that uh, may or may not have been uh, accurate, but 
you know, it's always something that we just have to uh, accept and work with. Do you know? Did you see a change? Oh, of course, over the years, yes. Okay. But uh, to this day, there could be somebody who wouldn't want a male student. And um, they might or might not be able to get another one. I mean, you know, it's like there's not that many different nurses to choose from on a shift sometimes, so it depends. We, uh, we didn't see, not early on, we, but what we did do is work at the, we, had, uh, we took our students to the VA. And I mean, that's how I, where, when I started out, we would take our students out there to learn how to do insulin shots. I mean, we showed them here on campus and they could, but that in order to get uh, many injections, just like now we will have students work uh, flu clinics and things to learn injections. Uh, you know, we, we went to the VA as to other community facilities for student experience. But I didn't see until, probably as they would come maybe in the baccalaureate level, and I personally, I'm not real familiar. I just don't remember in particular. We did have some. We had students actually that would come, like from Cave Junction and uh, other places. And uh, so, in those instances, there would often be we might deal with things like that relative to vaccinations, you know, uh, uh, meeting the requirements for school uh, for the young. The kids in their family, the babies that they were had in tow going to uh, have well baby checks or if they were sick, a lot of times those could overload emergency rooms. Well, I think for, um, for some people it was just very shocking and hard to accept. I know some families who lost um, sons to HIV, to AIDS, um, and hadn't even realized that, that anything until it was like so late. They just really, um, you know, hardly had time to try to repair relationships before that one died, you know, or anything. So, I mean, it was really a lot of um, blind, non, just judgmental, judgmental things that would keep people from trying to understand things sooner but in the, it did affect people in the hospital and so that we would be involved with our students taking have we have patients including <clears throat> children I mean babies born uh, with HIV you know I think it's just like um, it's just hard uh, we always were having to deal with precautions for hepatitis always for tuberculosis was a big in, thing because people wouldn't take stay on their medications and so in the, the community focus um, became huge for making home visits to um, people to see if they were taking their medications and um, you know as the drugs got they became drug resistant you know the idea one of the things that was so helpful with with the whole HIV thing is using combinations of drugs and um, to try to get at things, and, and that was so much better. But there were many, many, many years um, of gain, trying to gain understanding of even how to care for the people in the, properly in the hospital and everything, and to give them the support. Because anybody in a hospital with a communicable disease, that in isolation, the last thing they need is to be isolated from everybody socially, you know, and emotionally. And yet, it was necessary to keep the spread of things, and that was way before Ebola and some of these other kinds of incidents. So, um, but uh, anything that involves gender identity, um, both whether it's staff or I don't mean staff caucus, but the nursing staff or medical staff, I mean, or patients or community visitors, um, it's just really hard. It's difficult to deal with. And so over the years that I've been in nursing and that I work with students in different facilities, um, including when I was working on my doctorate in Austin, I had students in the hospital and we had lots of uh, people with uh, HIV and 
working through all the issues and, and keeping everybody safe, um, all the precautions that we had to use. It's, uh, you know, we thought it was so tremendous at the time, the effect, the toll it took on everybody. And at the same time, the growth of us as a human society was, was huge, too, because, you know, everybody started to learn, you know, oh, they, once you know somebody that has this, has whatever it is, you know, you realize that, Oh, they're just like uh, my family, just like me, and just like just you know kind of a thing. And so, there was a lot of social adjustment that uh, had to come along with it. Was not just the uh, the acute care and the community care that followed, all of which was difficult in a lot of ways, but so rewarding with the development of compassion that people could have for another human. Oh, I do. I remember in my own family. I have sons. Uh, there's a lot of was a lot of denial about all of that. But when I had to tell him one of his best friends from school had died of AIDS, you know, it's just he didn't believe there was such a thing. You know, it's just um, I know. So, um, but then then he became more aware. Um, it's just. One by one, it's an education. I do remember very early on, we were, we had to discuss this about what happens when you have students applying to the program. If they were known to be, um, not have that disease, which did turn up when I was in Texas, that, that was an issue there about protecting with affirmative action, with, with a, a, the, all of the rules for privacy that came up where you can't reveal any of this and that you have to keep everybody safe. Um, uh, yeah, that, that was a big issue down there. I was, at, I was not here at the time, but I was in Texas. And um, down there, people's parents were worried about, well, if you go there, you might get TB because the, the, the organisms had gotten more virulent at the time, you know, and um, so it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much which communicable disease. It's scary for parents, it's scary for people in the uh, environment. And, and, and it's really a, a faculty where we had to develop a lot of policies and things around all of that. Um, but I, I remember before we were talking about HIV, we were talking about gender identity and, and about having uh, a nurse perhaps who's um, a, a different um, orientation than you think they should be or something and and the the reactions in there so that we had to have discussions you know and about all of that just with relationships before we ever got to any disease things that and that we might be associated with these things more of it was with related to poverty um, and malnutrition and, and you know the damp environments that people lived in that was a would foster disease versus being out in the sunshine and the fresh air and you know some basic things people just didn't have you know you can't just we, we just take so many things I say we but you know many of us do take a lot of things environment that we have clean water and that it's safe to drink except when in so many communities that isn't the case so yeah it's just um, and look what's happening mean, if you think about it's just different scenarios but now we have shootings in the schools and we have do you know we have fires uh, we have so many things that uh, floods so many there's earthquakes uh, that can affect schools so when we would have students in the schools working which we did you know, you have to think about that kind of thing as well, you know, so we're not setting them or us up as we go to make our rounds and visit with them and stuff. So it, it, there's a lot of factors that um, involve definitely. They're just different issues now, uh, and some of the same as uh, many years ago, but um, the, the importance really of having nurses prepared here in the way that we want them prepared 
so they can take care of us, you know, and our families. Um, we do lose some out too. Either they go on for further education or they go back to maybe where they had always wanted to go or their families came from or, or whatever. Um, go travel the world and, you know, and they should do those kinds of things. Well, we do keep quite a large percentage here and we gain some from other places who come here. And um, because we have a nursing program here, um, even though it's an OHSU program that we have here now, people come here um, for the wonderful area that we have here with all the outdoor facilities and all the, the um, theater and, um, and music. We have wonderful facilities here. I mean, and tremendous talent in this community. So um, people come here and realize what a great place it is to live here or to be here, and they move here. So we gain some from other areas too. And uh, But I do think that has been a key reward even, is that we do have nurses in our community because we have this school here and starting with the original department. Um, so I don't know if that's at that part enough, but um, I do think it's been really important and I think it's worth putting research that's to put money into it and to put really high quality faculty into it. Um, and that really helps that we have, the, it's not just a school of nursing by itself, but that it's associated with this university, you know. And then um, the other, the other thing you asked me about greatest reward for me, I think as I was just starting to talk before, I think for me it's just seeing the nurses that, seeing the students that we had from way back in the beginning, and then we see what great people they've turned and great nurses they've turned out to be, and some of them return having gotten their doctorates and are teaching, you know, or things. It's just, uh, it, it's so rewarding to see that. And it's kind of, n not exactly the same, but it's comparable, I think, fairly comparable. How I feel as a parent, I have three grown children, love seeing them parent how they do things. The decisions that they make relative to their work and the, and the chosen things that they do. But, the, but seeing how they, teach or the patience they have with their kids, the, the, the love that they have and how they live their life. That's one of my, that's my greatest reward as a parent, you know, and I feel kind of like that, that, you know, there's a group of us, a faculty that taught together for years and we get together regularly and that's one of the things we heard this, always saying we were so grateful that we were nurses, we would do it again in a heartbeat you know, and um, it's just the greatest reward is just having been able to have been a part of the nursing profession.